going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Kind of Funny X-Cast, your home for all things Xbox here at Kind of Funny. Of course, I'm one of your hosts, Snowbike Mike, and today I am joined by just one of my gaming dads, Mr. Paris Lilly, because guess what? We got a super special guest. Your two gaming sons are now here, Paris Lilly. Blessing Adioye <laughs> Jr. is joining me. Of course, host of Kind of Funny Games Daily, host of Bless Who, and most importantly, host of the PS I Love You XOXO podcast, Perry Poppy. You look good in green, Blessing. How are you today? You look good in that this is awesome sweatshirt, uh, let me tell you. It pops. You got to give a big shout out to Greg oh, yeah. and the WWE team. This is a great looking sweatshirt. That's right a great now. looking sweatshirt. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. I'm rarely on Xcast. Yep. I feel like I'm only here for some of the bigger reviews to to fill in uh, Forza Horizon. Of uh, course, the, the, yes. this one I was here for, uh, and it's always great to be here. Yeah, you know, it's a treat when you're here, blessed because I admire you so much. You are incredible. Everyone knows you're the new face of video games. But most importantly, that means something really good oh, yeah. is about to go down in this podcast mm -hmm. because everyone has been talking about it. Hi-Fi Rush is now out. We're going to give you the X-Cast review. And, of course, it wouldn't be a good review without blessing because he is the man, the myth, the legend when it comes to rhythm-based games, all the parrying and pop-off poppy you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So, Blessing, I'm very excited to have that with you, but let's check in with my gaming dad. Paris, how you feeling? How you looking this week? I'm doing fantastic, and it is always an honor when I get to do a show with Blessing. I, 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 I truly appreciate his insights and his perspective when it comes to gaming. And for the game we're about to talk about, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued to hear what he's going to have to say. But uh, I'm doing good. Everything's good. Family's good this week. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's just jump into it and talk some games. I love that, Paris. We're going to talk some games. We have some really good news and some sad news to mm -hmm. talk about. And unfortunately, we're going to kick off the episode with a little bit of sombering sad news. But I wanted to share some love, some enthusiasm, and some hype for this game because we talked about it before, Rumbleverse. And man, oh man, we got to sit down with Adam Boys and the team from Iron Galaxy. And that was a really special one because this was a battle royale that kind of stole my heart, that brought something new to the Battle Royale genre, and I had a lot of fun playing it. And so the sad news is, over on the Rumbleverse Twitter, they have announced that we have the important announcement to share. On February 28th, 2023, Rumbleverse servers will go offline. Players who have made any purchase since launch will be eligible for a refund. We thank you for playing. Of course, there's more info on the refunds if you'd like to learn into that on the blog post. But I also wanted to jump in Adam Boys shared a nice dev team uh, open letter to the community, and I thought this was a really nice, put, uh, well put one that I think everybody should hear. So over from Iron Galaxy. At Iron Galaxy, we believe very strongly in the value of bringing people together to share meaningful experiences in games. Every single one of us is a gamer. It's what motivates us to create. With the announcement of the sunsetting of Rumbleverse, we want to share a more personal note with the players who have joined us in Grapital City. When you work on a video game, you imagine the community that will show up to play it someday. For years, we have dreamed about a lively city filled with people fighting to become a champion. We've strived to create a vibrant place that celebrated the competitive spirit. Our goal was to bring joy back to online multiplayer gaming. The people who gave Rumble Bursts a chance and took it on as a new hobby have validated every day that we put into bringing our ideas to life. We have loved watching you play. We have learned from our stories, your insights, and we have even passed around the arts you've created to immortalize your best moments in the streets. It is our sincerest hope that this news doesn't mark the end of Rumbleverse. You may not yet have seen the, the rumble in its final form. Hmm. If we can welcome people back onto the deck of the battle barge once again, we hope that you'll be there laced up and ready to take your rightful place in the cannon. Iron Galaxy will keep making games. It's our passion and our purpose. Our people are filled with the skills and inspirations to keep the world playing. Thank you, thank you for playing. This is not the last time you'll hear from us. This is not the last time we'll invite you to play. And this yeah. one really hit home with me because, of course, we got to know those developers so, so well. And also, this was a game that brought a lot of joy into my life, of course, kind of funny's lives with Greg, yourself, Blessing, and the team. We played a lot of this. And so I wanted to take a moment to celebrate the team at Iron Galaxy for trying something different. It is, of course, sad that they are sunsetting the servers and it will be going down for good as of right now. But I wanted to take a moment and just share some hype because, man, oh, man, Iron Galaxy, you nailed 
that video game. Nothing was more fun than giving the people's elbow from the top of a skyscraper, <laughs> DDTing somebody off of a building, and just having fun eating chicken and getting the meat sweat. So great job on your game. That was a blast. Yeah, It hurts my heart on, on two levels, Mike. I think, firstly, the fact that Rumbleverse is a great game. Yeah. And it came out, and it wasn't able to continue on past half a year, even though it was a great game, right? I think that speaks to kind of, kind of the harshness of the market right now when it comes to putting out a games as a service and putting out something that has to live based on the content that you put out, right? And even with the support of Epic Games, I don't know what the conversation was there, but it strikes me as crazy that they only gave this game half a year to yeah. survive and mm -hmm. like this was enough time for them to go, all right, we got to cut the cord, right? Like I feel like for at least you want to give a game like this at least a year or at least a couple of years to see if you can find a footing and find an audience and grow and do all that stuff. So for me, that breaks my heart. But then also you talk about how uh, Iron Galaxy is a studio and like who they are and what they've done. Iron Galaxy, for the most part, has put out bangers, right? Like their support studio uh, a lot of the time for other games, right? Like they've done work on, I believe, Uncharted Legacy of Thieves and a long list of games, right, when you go through it. But and Paris, you know, they took on Killer Instinct, of course. We yeah. know that one well with our Xbox. <laughs> I know, and that, that, and that's I know thing, that right? now. <laughs> you want to talk about original stuff, right? They did uh, um, uh, stuff on Killer Instinct and Killer Instinct. I was watching a um, um, Maximilian Dude video just yesterday. That was him listing his top 10 fighting games. And I want to say he had Killer Instinct, like this ver the latest version of Killer Instinct from, what, 2016 or maybe a little bit earlier than that for Xbox One. He had that as like his top two uh, like a lot of people love Killer Instinct for the mechanics for the mechanics of it, um, and yeah, like uh, uh, Iron Galaxy did a lot of work on that. They did Dive Kick, which I don't know if you remember Dive Kick, but that was uh, around a PS4 launch title, and I, I might have been on Xbox One as well. Uh, and it was like a really unique, weird looking fighting game that they made, and that I remember seeing and being like, "Oh, that looks really cool." Um, but yeah, they have a lot of talent there. I'm sure whatever they make next is also going to be uh, excellent because this seems like they're able to put out excellent stuff. But yeah, it hurts my heart that like. You know, they put out these things and then they come and then they go away and then they put out Rumbleverse and like half a year before it gets shut down by Epic. Um, that hurts. But yeah, salute to Iron Galaxy. Paris, any uh, final thoughts on Rumbleverse? Of course, you have until pretty much the end of the month here to jump in one more time to become champion. Yeah, a couple things on this. I'll start I'll start with this. So I, I was watching KFGD uh, earlier with, with you, Blessing, and Greg. And I, I believe it was Greg that brought it up, but... The fact I, I almost feel guilty in a way in that I know the game's dope. I love the game, but I wasn't playing it because I'm trying to do 10,000 other things at the same time. And it was always a oh, rumble verse. I'll get to that later. I'll get to that later. So I almost feel guilty in that way of was I part of the problem that this game didn't get the fair chance that it obviously should have gotten. And what was it? Six months. And, and it's going away, which is so unfortunate. I, I had even tweeted out yesterday of, you know, Iron Galaxy, you know, I feel for for the people over there to to have their their vision and their dream of this game cut short because they took a risk. They did something different. That's what you want in this industry. You want to see people take risks. You want to see people do different things with a game, with a genre. And I thought they they took that whole melee open world, you know, live service concept and mashed it all together. And it worked like, you know, shout out to Khalif, huge fan of the game. He's always talking about, it. I know Mike, I know you're playing it all the time as well. And to see that now go away is such a bummer because it, I wasn't playing it because I didn't like it. I was just busy doing other things. And to now realize that not enough people were playing it. Is, is just so unfortunate. It, it really is. And and to Adam's point in in uh, the letter that he wrote, I do hope it comes back in some form. I really do. I, I hope, I don't know if another publisher is picking it up or whatever the case may be, but I do hope this game gets a second life. And if it does, I will make sure to do everything I can to openly talk about it, to encourage people to go give it a shot because this game deserve, did not deserve this fate. It, it 100% did not. So, you know, great people over at Iron Galaxy, you know, to the point, they they always make dope games. This was another one, um, but it's just the harsh reality uh, of this industry right now where, you know, they, 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 they didn't get the time that they so deserved. It's yeah. unfortunate, but hopefully they come back. Yeah. Uh, one that I wanted to celebrate, I wanted to take a moment for, of course, alert fans that you can still play till the end of the month. So get out there, become champion one more time and enjoy that beautiful world that this team created. Blessing, the sad note as we move on, mm -hmm. another game added to you and I, games that we liked. 
which was Knockout City as well. Oh, yeah. These are two games that just came and went that were both very I mean, good. And Knockout City is still different. alive, right? I'm not crazy. It's like, I Knockout, thought we did ended you just read that. Something? <laughs> no, th Knockout City is still alive, but oh. they like they split from, from EA. They okay, went free to okay. play. I, and listen, is the writing on the wall for Knockout City? That's a different <laughs> conversation uh, because I don't know people that are playing Knockout City like that. But again, yeah. to Paris's point, right? And my part of the problem because I've yeah. not been playing Knockout City and I fucking love Knockout City. Um, but yeah, like Knockout City is another one that I do worry about that I would hate to see go. Let's switch up the news and bring you something fun because we have some big reviews coming away. We're going to talk about Hi-Fi Rush and Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition coming to consoles right now for this week's XCast because we post each and every Thursday at 6 a.m. West Coast, Best Coast time on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games and, of course, on podcast services around the globe. Don't forget, we are now Epic Games partners, which means if you are buying games off the Epic Games launcher, if you're upgrading your look in Fortnite, Rocket League, or Fall Guys, please use our Epic Creator Code, Kind of Funny, at checkout and help support the team. And talking about support, hey, here's a call out. We need your support. One Andy Cortez from Kind of Funny Games needs your support because the streamer awards are on the way and Andy Cortez needs your support. We would love to see him nominated for Souls Like Streamer of the Year and Variety Streamer of the Year. So if you're going out there, go to thegamerawards.com or thestreamerawards.com and please nominate Andy Cortez because we'd love to see him up there on those nominations for Souls Like Streamer of the Year and Variety Streamer of the Year. Talking about support, Bless, of course, we'd like to thank those who support us over on Patreon. And of course, we want to give a big old shout out to everyone watching live over on Patreon in the live chat. And of course, those who are the Patreon producers for the month of January, uh, February. Thank you to Delaney Twinning for supporting us as a Patreon. Delaney so Twining. Oh, thank you so much. How did I miss that after so many weeks? My <laughs> bad. Uh, and then this week's <laughs> XCast is sponsored by Grammarly, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. Blessing, I'm going to kick it over to you because you're our lead reviewer. You're bringing the hype and enthusiasm for Hi-Fi Rush yes, I am. from Tango Gameworks. Just dropped last week on a nice stealth drop. Tell me all about it. So Hi-Fi Rush is an excellent game. We've been talking about it a lot over the last week. This is, of course, the official review episode for Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, I believe I'm the lead reviewer here for Hi-Fi Rush. That's I correct. am indeed giving it a 5 out of 5. Whew. I think it is an amazing game. Uh, for me, I think the, the shocker with this one is the fact that you know, not only did this game come out of nowhere, not only did this game come from Tango Gameworks, who's done very different kinds of games from this one, right? They, they're known for Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo. Hi-Fi Rush came out of nowhere, is this very, very colorful, um, cel-shaded, uh, Saturday morning cartoon-styled rhythm action game, right? Where you're playing as the main character, Chai. You have your little cat robot named 808 who's with you. You're going through. You are getting into these um, fights with enemies, and it's very, it's very character action, right? Think of any of those games. Think, like, think Devil May Cry. Think any game where you're going through, you're doing combos, and then at the end of each combat encounter, you're getting a score at the end that, it, that can go all the way up to an S rank. Um, for me, the places in which... Hi-Fi Rush separates itself are the places where it decides to be unique. I think for me that starts off with the art style and with the art direction being the Saturday morning cartoon thing that, you know, doesn't just go for Saturday morning cartoons, right? There are so many different inspirations I can point to for where Hi-Fi Rush got so many of its different elements. You know, I look back and like, you know, Mythic, was it Mythic Force that came out last yeah. year? Uh -huh. that Myth had Force, a, yeah, yeah. Myth Force, yeah, that had um, a similar Saturday morning cartoon thing, right? And like that popped out in terms of, oh man, we saw the trailer and we looked at it and played it a little bit. But this, I think, takes it to a different level. They have that. There are some elements of Spider-Verse in terms of like the character animation, the frame rate, the, the comic book style of it. There are some Persona uh, inspirations that I can find in here, Persona 5 specifically, that I can find in here in terms of the character animation and also like the pop-up dialogue boxes and the way in which the... the, the uh, uh, the, the characters speak to each other. There's so much that goes into this game from just a presentation, and it all looks fantastic. Like I, I right before this, I put on um, one of those YouTube videos that is every cutscene uh, just of the game, and I sat back and I started watching it, and I didn't want to turn it off because it felt like I was watching a cartoon. That's how well <laughs> animated it is, and they go into these different animation techniques that made, that blew my mind in terms of there's a particular scene i should have sent it to bear before i got in here because it would be awesome to show but there's a particular scene where you go from doing a 
um, uh, what do they call it? Where you press the button at the right time and you have to like do all the, do all this stuff. Um, but you go from like a high action scene to then transitioning with smoke appearing on screen. That then transitions you to 2D animation, right? Strictly 2D. It goes from a 2D cutscene uh, from you, the main character Chai, then smashing through a window, and they use the the glass shards to then mask a transition back into 3D animation, so they can then pull it back the camera into 3D gameplay. Moments like that are the moments for me where I go, damn. You know, like they did the damn thing they put in they put in the effort to actually make this game present super well but then you get into the gameplay and the rhythm aspects aspects of it and those are excellent as well right you're talking about a combat system that asks you to play on beat everything that's happening in the world happens on beat the enemies attack on beat the animations in the background happen on beat and then for you to get the maximum score and like the maximum combo stuff uh you have to then press the buttons on beat right you have a light attack you have a heavy attack for the light attack you are hitting the duh Duh, duh, X, 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 right? Whereas for your heavy attacks, you are doing Y, 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 right? And you are hitting these things at different tempos. The better you get at the game and the more you unlock for your skill set, the more that evolves and the more involved that be becomes. And for me, it was around halfway through the game where I felt like I was entering a zone where it is, all right, hit these different combos, do the X, pause, Y, then mash Y for a different kind of combo. All right, now call in the companion uh, companion attacks that you can do, right, which is a whole different thing. Uh, I've been having such a blast with it. I beat it, and, like, as soon as I beat it, I wanted to go back into it, right? Like, this is one of the most fun games i played in a very long time for me. Um, but I'll leave it there, right? I don't yeah. want to I don't, we're, I don't we're gonna go in depth episode. on this, so don't you worry. We're going to keep it going. Paris, I know you played it as well. Where do you fall on Hi-Fi Rush? So this is the analogy I have to give you off the top. You ever seen, for anyone out there, if you've seen Kill Bill Volume 2, there's a training montage with Pai Mei with the bride, and he has the bride punching this, like this, this wood, right? Like over and over, kind of on beat. And she's doing it so much that in her sleep, she literally punches the wall, right? And then wakes up. That's Hi-Fi Rush for me. I am terrible at rhythm games. Absolutely terrible at them. I fully admit it. I knew it going in. But it's almost like Blessing was just saying. About halfway through, it started to click for me. And I started to get into that groove. And I'm starting to understand, you know, doing the different combinations and chaining things together. And when you put in that visual art style that you have and just all the different, you know, homages and genres that they pull into this game like like another one uh blessing didn't mention but i'll mention is like scott pilgrim it had such yes. scott pilgrim vibes mm, yes. to me as well i freaking loved it i freaking this is absolutely a five out of five it's just fun it's and it does it in a way of it takes someone like me who i would normally shy away from a rhythm game i wouldn't even pick it up but obviously it was on game pass shadow drop all right let's try it and it does it in a way where it guides me along and gets me to understand how to chain these combinations together and how all of this is going to work to the point where you get past like mimosas, one, one of the bosses, right? Kind of in the middle. Once you get to that point beyond that, now I've, I've trained you to understand all the different things that you're going to need to do in this game to go against some of the higher bosses towards the end. And it just freaking works. Throwing the music at the same time. I, I, I just freaking love it. I, I absolutely love it. And and I'll say this one thing before you go, Mike. I personally think, and maybe we can talk about this more, I think Microsoft has now finally found a new mascot. I wow. Yes. Okay. I, do. I really do. This is the, that was one of the things do. I tweeted out the first week the game yeah. came out was that like, yo, Shy and, Shy and 808 are shoe-ins for if Xbox ever does their own Smash Brothers. Yeah. Right? Like when you just yeah. look at their idle animation and it is – you know, him dancing to the beat, doing the snap, yeah. and then you see, like, the snap uh, word, like, the comic book pop-up come out when he's doing the snap. Oh, it's so good. Oh, Paris, I'm right yeah. there with you. I think Chai and the yeah. whole gang are definitely shooting yes. for a, a big conversation of what could be the next Xbox mascot. But I'm right there alongside both of you. I'm giving this game a 5 out of 5 as well on the kind of funny scale. This game's amazing. Plain, point blank, and simple. I didn't think that Tango Gameworks had it in them, right? You think of that team. We think of, of course, Evil Within 1 and 2. You think of Ghostwire Tokyo, which came off of kind of middling reviews that we talked about last year on the PlayStation side of things. And to have them stealth drop this during the Xbox and Bethesda Direct and it capture people's attention during that and then all of a sudden saying, it's out in a couple hours, go play it. I wasn't prepared for how good this was going to be. I thought, oh, we're just going to walk right past this. 
No, I'm blown away, Blessing. And I'm mm. someone who doesn't really care for the rhythm-based games. I'm somebody who can't catch a beat whatsoever. But I love a good 3D platformer. I love a good hack and slash. And, like, this blended all of that to the point where, as Paris just said, right, I grew to love and wanted to get better, right? I found myself pumping to the beat. I put my foot and I'm tapping to the beat to try to find the parry rhythm, try, try to find the jump on the elevator rhythm that was holding me back at the beginning of the game. And my only downfall that I had was I thought that the music was very samey on the first half of the game. But the moment that you got to the museum part, which is a probably about a little bit past halfway, the music roared. I mean, all of the tracks from that point forward felt unique, felt different, brought a different vibe. It almost felt kind of like Cowboy Bebop during that museum vibe, where it's like, ooh, I like this track a lot. And then it progressed, right? You got to Mimosa's fight on stage, and that hit. And then you got onward and upward all the way towards the end. And I, I really think the tracks shined at oh, the yeah. end of it. I thought the beginning felt kind of samey, but the end it shined. And you brought up the companion attacks. For someone who was really bad at the game, those helped me a lot, right? I relied yes. a lot on, yes. especially towards the end, you have all three companions, right? Calling them in in just succession yep. to be like, please help me. I use that a lot to my advantage. 1,000%. Another thing I want to bring up is the story and writing. Oh. I was surprised, again, halfway yes. through where I was like, wait, I'm really liking this story a lot, right? And the further I got into it, the more I was like, yeah, this story is great. The characters are great. I got to the point where I started shipping characters, and I'm like, yo, what, <laughs> what if this character start flirting with this character, right? Like, yeah. I, I kind of want to see this stuff play out. Um, the story is entertaining. I love the fact that you have points where it is, where there are twists and turns that uh, and yep. things that are happening. There are bits that I feel like shouldn't have been funny that I found funny. There is a there is a left shark joke in this game that is a dated Katie meme. Perry? Oh my Come god, on. the left shark joke yeah. was so I, Good. I had to pause and then look up left shark because I was like, yeah. there's no way they're making a left shark reference right yeah. now. Uh -huh. And I was like, yeah, they're making a left shark Center reference. Piece. Yeah, exactly. And, it's, and a lot of it worked. There's a moment early on in the game, I believe in the very first cutscene actually, where the main character Chai, like he goes through a thing where he like basically gets his iPod fused into him and he, he, he's a d defect. That's kind of how the game kicks off is, is the, the company Vandalay. They are um, a prosthetics company and they're a technology company, but he gets prosthetics through Vandalay and the operation uh, had a mishap. And so like he gets labeled a defect and then the robots go after him. But when he's on like the operating table and it's basically, it's a factory, it's a, um, an assembly line that he's going through. They label him defect, and then they the um, the assembly line tosses him into a wall. He hits the wall, hits the floor, starts rolling around in pain. And like the way it's animated and even the voice acting is so top notch. Like it is the the cutscenes the cutscenes in this game are fantastic, right? Let alone you get into the boss fights and the boss um, transitions where it is a boss start and it's like whoa, holy shit! I was not expecting this thing to happen in this cutscene. There are so many uh, delightful moments in this game yeah. just through the story and just through the cutscenes that blew me away here. I'm right there with you on the story and the dialogue. I thought hit on all notes, and this is something where you see this game at first and you're like. This could be more for the youth. We could label it kitty rights, but like mm. the whole story kept me engaged and I loved all of the voice acting. I loved all of the lines that they delivered. I thought it was really good. And like that was a testament to for a eight to 12 hour game, right? Depending on how fast you're playing and where you're at. This kept me through all the way. And yep. I laughed every single time. There was a cool little side story of a robot on the sideline that you could go see. And he's trying to avoid work or he's getting put, teamed up with other robots he hates. Like, there was fun things if you explode that world that just kept it going and built out this world that I want to see more of, right? Like, I could see this easily as a Netflix anime. I could see us doing some sort of similar to the Halo television show, Microsoft, let's figure this out right now and start making some fun Netflix shows out of this right away because I wanted more of this world. And I liked the bosses felt like big Borderlands moments, right? I think a lot of people saw mm -hmm. that first initial jump and go, oh my God, Sunset Overdrive, right? It had like these really fun, cartoony, awesome games that we know and love from Sunset Overdrive to Borderlands that were over the top and it just felt so at home with this.
Yep, one thousand percent. And one thing to go back to the thing uh, Paris mentioned. You know, Paris mentioned the Scott Pilgrimness of it. Yes. And again, going back to this game, making really good references. There is uh, a scene that feels like a one for one reference of uh, one of the scenes <laughs> where he's getting ready, where it is yeah. like you know he like you know pulls down the sleeve, turns it like zips up the coat, and then like with the putting on the shoes, it takes him a second because he has to like get the back of his shoe in right the uh, the right way. There's also a very direct JoJo reference, uh, multiple JoJo references, JoJo's bizarre adventure adventure references uh, in this uh, game. They have everything like it feels like they are pulling in so much of what they love and in turn it's making me love it i am not a jojo person but i appreciated just like the straight up direct reference to jojo because it, you could tell that these guys are fans of, of the stuff that they're putting in here and it's all lifting it up like it all it all feels very i guess irreverent is the word i'm looking for paris we celebrate this game all three of us here at the table give it a five out of five what is next now? When we look at this, do you look at Tango Gameworks and that team and say, hey, here's a larger budget. Let's build off of this. Where do we go with that? Or do we continue to let them cook up whatever they want to do? Because this was a hit that I don't think many people were expecting. I think if this team wants to continue this story, wants to stay in that Hi-Fi Rush universe, you absolutely let them do it. It would be, quite honestly, a wasted opportunity to not do so. Um, to what I alluded to before, I, I, I think just even just with 808 as a minimum, imagine 808 opening up the Xbox showcase, right? Imagining doing something like that. The crowd would lose their minds. These characters are now characters that you're going to want to see to see again. You're going to want to integrate them into other properties if you potentially can. This screens Netflix anime, you know, as you alluded to already. What? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do something else within entertainment with with these hi-fi rush characters within this world? So, yeah, I I, I can't imagine them not doing a hi-fi rush sequel. I, I just can't. It 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 makes too much sense to continue this momentum. Um, sure, it was a shadow drop, and you know, you got this early buzz with it, but. The more people that have been picking this game up and playing it, if you just pay attention to social media, look at the Metacritic, Metacritic scores, it, it wouldn't have mattered. It's a good game. It, it is a, a, a game that should absolutely should not be a one off. We need more of this for sure. So I, I, I fully expect to, to hear an announcement within the next you know, months, you know, throughout the rest of the year that they're going to do more with High Five Rush. It's just such a great opportunity to yeah. do so. And I think it's just such a great hit for Game Pass and for what Xbox yeah. is doing right now. Yeah. You know, it's interesting looking at Xbox and how they've been, they've been functioning in the conversation about, you know, does Xbox have the games? Are they bringing the games? How how consistent are the games? And now you've had back-to-back -back months where you're, you've had games like Pentiment come out and Pentiment got a 10 out of 10 from IGN. Pentiment is a critical darling, right? And it's doing what it's doing. And now you have Hi-Fi Rush, which is also getting very great reviews, um, us being one of them. And then also... A lot of people are tuning in for it, right? A lot of people are showing it to Game Pass. I think the Shadow Drop worked perfectly for what this game is because it is a game that as soon as you see the trailer, you want to pick up the controller. And I think letting that um, simmer for a little bit, right? And having it be a, okay, let's reveal this game in 2022 or 2023 and then have it come out in 2024. I, you would have had that calm down. And I like that the game would have came out and been great anyway because playing this game is a great game regardless. But I think the Shadow Drop helps so much and it works so much because of Xbox Game Pass and it being a thing where it is, oh, I don't have to spend $60 for it. I can just pick it up right now and play it. I think that's a powerful thing. And I think that's a thing that you have to, to, to capitalize on, especially given who Tango Gameworks is and their recent output. You know, Ghostwire Tokyo was one that I would not tell you that that game needs, or I wouldn't even say I expect a sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo. I'll be shocked right. to see a sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo. Evil Within, who knows, right? Like that's gotten a couple of iterations and I know there's a, a, a fan base there, but Hi-Fi Rush feels like it's speaking to such a... Um, uh, to a broader audience in a very, in a almost more targeted way where I am playing Hi-Fi Rush. I want a fanboy Hi-Fi Rush, right? I want to be all about <laughs> Hi-Fi Rush. I want to rep Hi-Fi Rush. And that's because it is a game that is very particular, right? It's a game that is so colorful and so, and it's about rhythm and like all the characters are named after tea flavors and like it has so much unique energy to it. And I love I, I I absolutely love that we can get this game on this budget level from an Xbox first party because I feel like this kind of thing absolutely. is rare. And this is me speaking from somebody who's on the PlayStation podcast, right? Where like I love the PlayStation games, of course, but you know, like I feel like the closest game to something like this on this on PlayStation is Ratchet and Clank, right? And Ratchet and Clank is something that is big budget family title, but also isn't something that is that's as weird and unique as this. Like Hi-Fi Rush 
playing it, I think the thing that makes it stand out the most is the fact that it's this different, but also this quality, right, with this budget. You don't get that that often. Yeah, I think it's something really to celebrate, and bless you brought it up so well, right? We've had a tough 2022, and I think Xbox coming out with the showcase and this stealth drop has really brought a lot of energy back to the Xbox side and got the excitement of, hey, 2023 is going to be a good year. We got a lot coming your way, and this is a great way to start us off, right? This is great on this side. And for me, when I look at the future, yeah, I hope we get back to this. I hope that we can find a way to make it bigger and better, right? For me, I look at it as like, let's sunset overdrive this thing and let's get into a big open world and still have really special set pieces and narrative awesome, you know, or more linear levels with great soundtracks. But I want to move around in this world, mm -hmm. right? Like flying yep. on those rails, I was like, yeah, let's get more of this all across the big map. Let's have some fun building out this world even bigger. So I hope we see more. Interesting. On this. See, I go the opposite direction where I like this game being linear and what I want in terms of uh, things I think they could do better. You talk about the soundtrack, you talk about halfway through the soundtrack picking up. I would want to see Tango Gameworks partner with a higher profile composer or somebody that is going to put their all into the soundtrack of this game, whether it be, oh man, I'm bad with names, or whether it be the Jet Set Radio composer, um, uh, Hideki, I'm not going to guess his last name, uh, or Meguro, who does the Persona 5 soundtrack. I think you got to partner up with one of those, right? Somebody Ooh. who's of that ilk and really like define what the sound of this game is. And I think you go hard with the, the score system, right? Hey, we have five co combat encounters, eight combat encounters per level, can you get can you master this game right can you get the can you get master each level by level and have it be this the smaller thing because i think when you keep it condensed like this one you're probably able to get this game out a bit quicker than you would be able to do a um an open world game but then also i think it being this linear and it being um this limited in terms of the amount of content in it makes it a more replayable thing and i think appeals to this style of gamer i love that paris what'd you have for me yeah three things uh First, going back to seeing this in other properties, I don't know if you got to see someone from the community has already created a library in Forza Horizon 5 for Hi-Fi Rush and put it out there with the code to the community. I know awesome. it was kind of going around on social media. It's so dope seeing that. But that's kind of the point. You've, you're already in these early days starting to see community engagement around this IP. So absolutely, you got to take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing is... Yeah, it's great that it's in Game Pass and obviously people are engaging with it there and this does brings even more value to that service. But look at the Steam sales as well. People are willing to go out and buy this game because they want to play it and they want to enjoy it. It's not just a quote unquote Game Pass game. It's a good game that is worth your money to, to go out and spend. Um, and then the third thing on this is when, like you said, you, you look ahead to the future of what Hi-Fi Rush, you know, potentially could be. Think about it also from an Xbox standpoint. This is a Japanese developer, Tango. What does this mean for other Japanese developers out there to see the success that this game is having on an Xbox platform? Maybe this will encourage more Japanese developers that aren't a part of Xbox Game Studios to want to put their games on the platform and do unique things things that are outside the box because here's a game that typically you don't see on an xbox platform having huge success so maybe other japanese developers will see this and bring some of their unique unique ideas to the platform as well yeah the future is so far away, but you know what? Right now, you can play Hi-Fi Rush. You can have a great weekend enjoying some awesome tracks, some really fun rhythm-based action third or, or third person platforming you can go play it all right yeah now. so shout go out have uh, fun really quick to the voice actor of akechi and uh the voice actress of futaba who get to be friends in this game and not enemies like in persona 5 you know ah. what i'm saying mm. plus oh, yeah. also shout out to the decaf coffee bit which like so is good a, is a constant throughout the game and uh, one recommendation i want to uh, like shout out is like you know you're you're if you're like me and you're trying to explore and actively go not towards where the, uh, the game wants you to progress, like actually read the stuff that like the tablets and stuff that you come across. Cause those like, you're talking about like humor and stuff uh, that they deliver throughout this game, the humor and just the, like the emails that employees send each other or from like the big bosses are also just like, they, they dive deeper into like enhancing some of the jokes that you see in cutscenes and stuff like that. It's just, it's really special. It's uh, yeah. in, 
almost every aspect I would say of this game. It's just it's so masterfully done of and how they bring it all together. This in this again, the story is really good. Like I like what they had mm. to say about <laughs> big corporations, right? And like the um uh, uh I forget the word I'm looking for, but like you know, big corporations being evil, right? Like I I it, it, it they explore that in such a fun way that is also very family friendly and that is also very understandable. Um and yeah, like there's so many different bits and so many pieces of writing that I think are really funny. And yeah, you can go and talk to like pick up the items to pick up the tablets and then talk to the little robots that you'll find on on your way or like um there's the character I think it's named Smidge who's like a fridge that'll help you give tutorial that'll give you tutorials and there are some really funny bits with that character as well um there, there's so much personality in it in it and i've seen yeah. like i've seen conversation online about like oh man but like is this not cringe versus other games and i'm like hey man if you're qual if you're if you're riding is quality like People will fuck with it. They're People owning, will like it. They're yes. owning this writing and because they know what it is serving for this type of story and game, or is like maybe a game like Forspoken didn't know what the hell it wanted to be. So maybe, you know, the writing in there might come off a little bit more cringeworthy in that, you know? Paris closes out. I saw you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, just another shout out from a technical standpoint. Uh, the fact that I was able to play this on my Xbox Series S, move over to my Xbox Series S, then pick it up on PC, hop on the Steam Deck on cloud streaming, and yep. then go on the Logitech G Cloud on cloud streaming, all seamless. Just picked up right where I left off each time. Fantastic experience. Well, overall. that's I taught so you that. What is that? that? The what? The X Cloud? The the cross the cross save? Play anywhere. Play anywhere. That's what play it is. Play anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. Me and Bless yeah. talked about it earlier in the week. It's I nice. did the same thing where I started playing on my <laughs> laptop at work, and then I got went home, played on my Xbox, and then later on, I I picked up my Steam Deck, and yeah, I played through through X Cloud. Uh, a couple things I'll throw out there in yeah, terms throw of it out. Uh, um, things that I think the game could get better. I okay. think the, the the platforming I think is okay, but I think it could be better. You know, like the main character of Chai isn't that mobile. Like when you do do his dash, the dash feels more geared toward the combat than the actual platforming and mm -hmm. all this stuff. I think you can find ways to maybe give him more leeway to feel, to, to give uh, the platforming a little bit more energy and maybe finding different ways in which you can construct the levels to make the platforming a little bit more involved in, in, in fun. Um, but there's that. And then the button scheme, Barrett re, uh, remapped his buttons, which maybe I should have done. But in the button scheme that I used, the main thing that I had a problem with was um, the companions and having the right companion equipped because it is like yeah. the companions are at the top left of which ones you have equipped. And it's the one that's to the furthest right is the one that you have. Um, but doing like L2 to stack up between them and then R in this very fast paced, fast motion game, I would get lost in that quite a bit. Um, I And I don't know what the solution would be uh, wholly because I usually I would suggest a weapon wheel, but yeah. this isn't a game <laughs> that you would want a weapon wheel in because yeah, it was such you don't want to slow down time. It was a good blend to keep it moving fast, but I did find myself like hitting the bumper above it and all of a sudden tethering to somebody yes. instead of oh i just wanted to switch you know what yeah. i mean also man shout out to the magnet the uh, that's like very much like the spider-man you web zip to yeah. somebody yeah. to continue your, your combo such a good mechanic paris what'd you have on that oh this this isn't a slight against a game this is a me problem but uh shout out to the samurai in there i think oh, that's what like track five six up in there somewhere. but literally was about to throw my controller <laughs> a few times i had to walk away because i'm not good at pairing i'm just not it's just that's that's my weakness in the game and my god i i, I could not get past the pairing part yeah, with samurai I, to I, save my life that was a that was definitely a wall for myself as well and I, you know i the former percussionist like I, I pride myself on having rhythm and stuff like that but i think it was more of the visual component of the circle <laughs> over circle thing that would fuck up my mm. internal rhythm oh and then my god was like, yes i would get it if it was just like a clap 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 and then if they just gave me a beat and then i repeat it but like the visual thing i think was like getting oh, me off tempo hold on i got i got it in my control i have to show you this is literally me in there i'm just like completely focused <laughs> doing it trying to hit the beat the entire <laughs> time oh it's driving me crazy but yeah i played on steam deck and uh yeah the i highly recommend like the uh or e even for regular controllers for like xbox because i think you can go into the game settings in and of itself and like completely remap the controls i had the light attack on rb the heavy attack on right trigger um i still had like the hook shot uh thing on lb and then I think my parry I put on left trigger. And then because I was doing the Steam Deck, I uh, mapped the jump button to the uh, right paddle. And then I think the dash to the left paddle. Um, and yeah, so and then the calling in uh, friends and uh, using their abilities I had on the D-pad. So mm. uh, I didn't really have oh, to like, yeah. move my 
hands a lot uh, over to like the face button yeah. or anything. That's a good call. Blessing, any other things before we get out of here that you'd like to see improvements on? Uh, oh, man, I had one and I totally lost it. Uh, go to Paris and then come back to me for a second. Okay, Paris, do you have any improvements that you'd like to see? Well, actually, Barrett just called it out. I didn't remap anything. Okay. Um, I didn't okay. realize that. I need to do that. It, it, I, honestly, I, I don't have a lot of complaints, like I said, from, from a technical standpoint for the game. I think... It, it's doing exactly what it should be doing. I almost feel like it's more of a me problem than mm. than anything. So I, I really can't have too many complaints. My, my only small complaint, and I think this is a lot on me as someone who couldn't find the rhythm and is now trying to balance a lot going yeah. on of on the screen, finding the beat, getting the beat in my hands and in the motion, yeah. right, was that double circle threw me off a lot, right? Because it has <laughs> the circle that closes and then the circle in the middle. And you would think that's when you press it, but like, I would yeah. find myself more often than not, I would try to press it at that and they would say I failed, right? And it, it just, I couldn't figure out what am I doing, right? And so I just, I don't know if that was a me thing or if it was like, is it really the middle circle? Because I'd mm. like it to be that. It didn't feel like it was like that most of the time. I think jumping off of that, one of the things I'll throw out there, uh, it's the thing that the game, uh, one thing that the game did well, um, but I think could do a little bit better okay. would be accessibility. Because um, if you go in the menus, there are options. So it is like, there are moments where the game wants you to do these rhythm um, QTEs that are, you know, B, Y, B, like, like kind of go back and forth. Yeah. They have options for you to be like, okay, no, I just want one button, one button as opposed yeah. to having to go back and forth. I think they could even go further than that for people who don't have any rhythm. Because I think for the most part, <laughs> the game is good Thank about you, allowing you to fight and stuff off rhythm if you don't if you're not able Correct. to have a beat right like it's the only thing is that your attacks are going to hit on the beat right and so like if you're on the beat it's better for your score and for all that stuff but you don't have to have rhythm for those parts but there are parts that you do have to have rhythm for i think the game could be a little bit better about uh having accessibility for people, for people who don't have rhythm thank you bless yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, can't oh. catch the beat mode and mike <laughs> is playing in that way that's what i'm playing <laughs> oh I, I have one last funny moment do not Play this game when you're on the struggle bus in front of your children. Oh, Do no, it. Man. Because no, no. the roasting and the mocking that I was getting, like, I, I literally just threw the controller on the ground and walked out. I was like, I, I can't do this. Stop watching me. You're putting too much pressure on me. This is too much. But, but, but that's the fun of the game, though, because it is so satisfying when you finally nail it. It's so good. Like, I, I just felt that adrenaline rush when I finally, I was like, oh, my God, I got past it. And then you go on to the next thing. So I adore the game. Like I said, Blessing, it's a five out of five. Yep. Absolutely fantastic. If you've not played it, it's on Game Pass. I think, what is it, 30 bucks if you go buy it outright. Pick it up, try it, you'll love it. One more thing I'll throw out there in the opposite direction of what I just said, right? In terms of accessibility, I think the game could have gone harder <laughs> on some like yeah, on, on some of those those parry sections, specifically where it is the you are fighting a boss and then like the boss goes into like superpower mode and then it hits you and then you have like the call and response where it's like ba 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 and then you have to do that with your parry or sometimes they'll throw a throw a dodge in there. I think those could be longer <laughs> and involved okay. and more involved. I like right? that. Like, no, I want, no. I, <laughs> I like, yeah, I want okay, that okay. to be more of a challenge. That's right. For the, that's for the bad ones. Yeah. Like, for the bad like ones I, out there. I, cause for, I never failed any of those. Like I, I hit all those perfect. And I think if you made them a little bit longer and also maybe a little bit like going back and forth between the dodge and the parries and like, maybe adding one more thing in there. I, I, oh man, I think you people, I think I'd get in the zone <laughs> with okay. that. I want to celebrate just one thing before we go. Nothing felt better than getting that beat on the big moments and then having the six slice through yep. the enemy. Woo, yeah. That was some dope Very animation satisfying. right there. So dope. But, of course, this game is dope. It's a kind of funny five out of five. It's amazing. You should go play that right now if you're over with the X-Cast crew on the Xbox ecosystem. And we want to thank Blessing for joining us here on today's X-Cast. We have a whole lot more fun coming your way. Right after a word from our sponsors, we're going to talk Age of Empires 2 on console, and then we're going to have a little one-on-one, -on -one, Paris, you and I, about Halo. We'll hear from you right after this. Shout out to Grammarly for sponsoring this episode. From essays to emails, Grammarly's communication assistants can help you write with confidence. Grammarly is a must-have for every student. Best of all, it's free to download and works on all your favorite devices and apps. A ton of us here at Kind of Funny have been using Grammarly for years, and Joey specifically is a huge fan. She says, and I quote, Grammarly 
is used with everything. Emails, tweets, even writing our weekly schedule. Sometimes my brain works faster than my fingers and it's nice to have a second set of eyes. The free versions of Grammarly offers comprehensive writing suggestions, a tone detector, and a synonym feature, all to help you proofread your work as you write. So you can be sure it's mistake-free and polished before submitting. Grammarly Premium comes with advanced features like clarity full sentence rewrites, which flag and rephrase hard to read sentences. Premium even comes with plagiarism detection from essays and projects to emails and presentations. Improve your grades this semester with Grammarly. You can sign up for an account today at grammarly.com slash kind of funny and get 20% off when you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y.com slash kind of funny. Grammarly.com slash kind of funny. In another game that I'm excited to share the excitement for, and I hope that you give a shot to, Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition on console right now. Paris, you and I got to review the game. Of course, we were provided the code by Xbox and the Age team early, so we got to go hands-on. A couple caveats to that. Of course, no real online play as reviewers were playing it, so we weren't teaming up 4v4 like I would dream of. And most importantly, our progress didn't carry over. No achievements, so a lot of people kind of apprehensive on how in-depth you want to go. Paris, I'll tell you, I lost my mind and I played a ton of it because <laughs> Age of Empires 2 on console is great. On the kind of funny scale, it is a four out of five. I am so impressed with what the age team was able to do to capture this incredible, just one of a kind, one of the goats of the RTS genre on the console, and then most importantly, on controller. And I can't wait to talk all about it with you, but Paris, I was so impressed with the controls. The look of the game is still beautiful and holds up. After 25 mm -hmm. years of Age of Empires, it is crazy that this game just looks so good. And it's only Age of Empires 2, of course, Age 4, coming out later this year on console as well. But I loved every moment that we had. Of course, it is the full game. I want to just reiterate all the content because I wrote... Tons of content on my review here from the Xbox Wire. This is what you can enjoy. 83 maps, 42 multiplayer civilizations, 34 single-player campaigns, 10 multiplayer modes, and 7 co-op campaigns. There is a ton of content to get lost in, but most importantly, it's about the input and controls. And that's what I want to circle back yes. to and talk about is you know the content, you know the game, but can an RTS make its way on the console. We've seen Halo Wars. We've seen Lord of the Rings, Battle for Middle Earth. We've seen other RTSs do it, but such an, I don't know how I would call this one. This is a very complex RTX is what I would call this one, uh, Paris. And the question was, you and I, prior to this was, can they put it on controller and make it feel good? And I'm happy to say, Paris, that I, they did. It's not a, I believe it is 100% they did. And now there are some shortcomings that we'll talk about in this review on the controller. But all in all, you can play this game. You can have a ton of fun and you can make this happen on, on controller. Yeah. And I'm pleased with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of the way I, I would describe it because my focus on playing this was I, let, let's check out the how the controller works, the input using the controller when compared to mouse and keyboard. So that was my focus when when I played through. So, you know, I did the opening tutorial um, and then I did a battle scenario with with Attila, Attila the Hun um, and felt, you know, I got a good gauge on how the control system would work in Age of Empires 2. And to your point, I mean, it's a classic game, still looks great on, on the Xbox Series X. No, no issues there at all. But it works. I mean, there's a few compromises th that are there, but it is truly an enjoyable experience to be able to play it on console with the controller. So I think in that aspect, yeah, this was a home run for them. So I think think your score of four out of five feels about right. I mean, there's there's a few, like I said, compromises where, where they needed to obviously automate a few things, you know, from a controller aspect where you'd have free reign using a mouse and keyboard, you know, obviously having the you know, your shortcut keys on, on the keyboard to be able to signal certain things with the troop and automate, you know, buildings and, you know, getting resources and things of that nature makes it a lot more convenient. But what they were able to do on the Xbox controller, I think totally worked. And for anyone new to the series, and I think that's the more yeah, important yeah. thing, anybody new to, to the Age of Empire series picks up that controller, they're going to feel comfortable. 
get it. They're not going to feel that they're fighting controls. They're not going to feel any type of frustration being able to go into that. And to your point, we weren't able to do any multiplayer scenario. So I don't know how I would feel going against a human component, but going against, you know, the, the AI in the game felt good really did so i had a very enjoyable experience with it and you know looking forward to now having the final game and being able to save progress really sinking some time into it yeah paris for me you know the controller was one thing but like there was two big questions i had going into this review and that was bringing on newbies into the franchise and of yeah. course showcasing the controller but also teaching and showing this rts game right like RTSs aren't very prevalent on the console. Not many of my friends have played Age, right? And so how do we onboard them in a proper educational and fun way? And I think mm -hmm. this William Wallace campaign that they created, which is the tutorial you jump into, not only showcases the controller and what we're able to do from the mouse and keyboard onto that, but also like teaches you and handholds you in a way where it's not only fun, but it goes over everything. And I think that's the big takeaway, right? I try to yep. introduce my friends to this and it's a lot, right? When I say complex RTS, there's <laughs> villagers and resources that you need to manage. Yes. There are PVE, like AI livestock that you need to gather and fight wolves and boars and get food off of and forge. You need to now build a base. You need to come, you need to elevate and evolve that base. You also need to battle people and unit manage, right? And so there's so much into that. And I think they really nailed that in the tutorial, right? And a big part about that is villager priority menu. This is something that they really worked hard on of kind of taking that hey, Paris, here's 20 things to juggle. Let us take one kind of vital part off of your plate yeah. and let the AI handle that. Yes. And I think for new players, that's going to be big. Of Instead of going, hey, Paris, do I juggle wood and then gold? Do I go to stone? Where do I get my food? How do I do this? You can auto-assign your villagers to do that, right? They can auto-lay crops and plant their own fields. They can go and say, hey, we want to prioritize meat, stone, and then gold and wood are going to be on the lower side. There's a big wheel that allows you to pick the way that you want to play. And I think that's a big deal here for new players is the onboarding process and taking that and saying, hey, it's already a lot putting this all on controller, but also playing this game is tough. Let's help you a little bit. And that was a big win for me on that side, which I want to give them kudos yeah. for. Absolutely. And, and to your point, I mean, this is almost kind of the precursor to age four on, on console, yeah. which, you know, I know a lot of people are going to want to experience as well. And the way I look at it is this. The console version is totally playable, totally enjoyable. You will have a great time, you know, playing it, understanding the Age of Empires universe, how it works how an RTS works and all that. But if you do want to become an advanced player, and this is, this is just a fact of it, if you want to truly be an advanced player at it, because say you're really loving it and now you want to take it to the next level, jump on PC. That, yep. That's just the truth of the matter. I I do believe, I'm, if, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you can do mouse and keyboard. Yes, you can. On the yes, console, because uh -huh. I did not try that at all. So I, I, I'm speaking from ignorance when it comes to that. So I don't know if they take those training wheels off for the for if you plug in a mouse and keyboard if if now it it simu truly simulates the pc experience that i do not know but if it doesn't and you want to have that experience like i said then you want to move over to pc yeah so you do have the ability to plug in mouse and keyboard into console if you so well please and there's also optional cross play with pc players so if you're just learning and you want to stick to just other people maybe learning and playing on controller only you can turn off that mm -hmm. cross play you can restrict those pc players from playing with you that might already know the game after you know the 20 year plus lineage or, you know, you can turn it on and have some fun with all of your friends in the ecosystem, which I think is really important and cool because it is Age of Empires, right, Paris? It's just now you can play it on yes. control if you so well please. It's not, we're not missing any content out of this. It is the Age of Empires 2 package with everything in it. And that's really special as well. Some of my only critiques of this, Paris, is because it is so complex. And we talked about taking everything from this mouse and keyboard setup and putting it on controller. This is one of those of like, if you don't head dive into this and like really try, I feel like for passer buyers or players that will play it every so often, you are going to forget a number of things, right? We've packed a yes. lot of shortcuts. We've packed a lot of commands into the controller. And even for me, someone who's played a lot of age, when I skipped two days on playing controller, I quickly forgot a lot of inputs. And that was tough to 
re-find out what was that control? How did I get to this shortcut? What is the button mapping for that? And that's my only concern of bringing my friends into this, right? If we play once a week or once a month, that's going to be a tough hurdle for them to climb because with mouse and keyboard, it's so simple. You can just click away, right? It's You can be brain dead mm -hmm. and keep it easy. But on the controller, it's a little more complex than that of like, you got to know a little bit of where this needs to go here and what links to what. And that's my only concern for people who might play this every so often is my only concern there. Yeah, I would agree on that. Yeah, and then also, of course, on the campaign, it's a lot of unit uh, units that need to be moved into the right places, mm -hmm. and I want you to know that you'll find moments where you're probably right at that spot you need to be, and it's probably not progressing for you. Just take that unit, move it a little bit more into different areas. It will w it will wake itself up, and it will get there. It, it, fin it felt kind of finicky, where it would be like, take Joan of Arc to this certain area, and I'd be there and going, what's happening? Just kind of move around to different spots. It will it will wake itself up and go there. Those are my two critiques. But all in all, as an Age of Empires fan and someone who loves the franchise, I am so pleased with what they did. Uh, this was my major concern in 2022 when they announced this. Can you put it on controller? I am happy to say, heck yeah, they did. Yes, and I can. can't wait for Age 4. It's going to be a blast. And so shout out to the Age team. You did something that I was reluctant and worried about. You proved me wrong. So good job on that. Um, Paris. Two great reviews, a whole lot of energy heading into 2023, a lot of positivity and fun, which is really something special here for the X-Cast. But I do want to finish this show off with a little one-on-one -on -one with you because yep. yesterday we had a big report come out from Jason Schreier over at Bloomberg, and he wrote a really good piece about 343 and what's going on with Halo. And, of course, it's easy to talk about the now the future is so far away on where Halo will stand, but there's some big takeaways from here. And I want to kind of have a one-on-one -on -one with you, a sit-down of where are we at with Halo? What is the current vibe check with 343, Halo Infinite, and the future, right? And I think Jason has some big points that we need to talk about. Of course, you can go check that out over on Bloomberg. Jason Schreier with a big-time report for 343 and Halo for all you fans out there. But some of the big notes right here. The team looking to move to Unreal for the future uh, with Project Tatanka in the works with 3-4, or no, yeah, with 3-4-3 and Certain Affinity. And so nothing confirmed yet, Paris, besides Certain Affinity in their uh, Unreal project, right? Nothing confirmed that we're leaving slip space yet. And that was the engine that they've been using for quite some time. That was a lot of the big issues that we heard from the team of Maybe this is kind of on the older side. We're bringing in contractors. We're letting go of contractors. Maybe we need to be on something where more people can use this instead of jumping on board and learning a new engine for them that might be a little bit on the older side, right? And so that was interesting of Unreal, is this going to be the future for Halo? And another big one they talked about was it, it's not firm on if the engine switch is going to happen. Nothing has been confirmed from 343, but he wrote that internal skeptics are worried that the switch could affect the way that Halo games feel to play. And that was a big one for me because I felt like this Halo, we nailed the feel of Halo. And that's my worry right there, Paris. And that's why I want to start right now. The idea of moving away from slip space into Unreal and that feeling that we had with Halo Infinite. I think that was the big moment that we all said, Man, they nailed the gameplay of this. My worry is if we move away from that, will I miss out on what we had there, Pear? So let's talk about Unreal and Slip Space. Where are you feeling on that, the engine itself? Yeah, so let me just say off the top, I, I was actually on IGN Unlocked earlier today. So what I'm about to talk about, we had a fantastic discussion about this very subject. So I, I may be repeating myself. I know I'm going to repeat myself on some of the things that I said over there. But you, you bring up a great point about, about Slip Space and the rumored moving over to Unreal Engine 5. And, and I'm looking at it two different ways. So we've talked about this before on, on the show. It is pretty clear Slip Space from a technical standpoint, from a system level standpoint, has been holding back game development. This is probably why, again, speculation, I know nothing, but this is probably why we've not seen a steady stream of content coming out for Halo Infinite, which ultimately is why we're in the position that we're in right now. We know the campaign was solid. We enjoyed it. The multiplayer had a great debut. The issue has been the last year and a half, where's the content? 
Where's the new maps? Where's the new modes? Where's the innovation in this? Yes, Forge is out now and we're starting to see some of these things, but is that too little too late? So here we are. There has been obviously a complete overhaul in leadership at 343. Unfortunately, we've seen mass layoffs with the studio. So the studio has been downsized. So one of the things that I brought up is, and, and I even said this on Twitter earlier this week, Halo is too important of an IP to the Xbox library to let Master Chief and to let this IP become irrelevant. Just is. So whatever it is that you have to do to get Halo to where it needs to be, that's what you do. Obviously, Pierre, the new studio head, we're obviously seeing different things. Kiki Wolfkill, as an example, is no longer heading up things on the entertainment side for Halo. She's moved on to a different division in Xbox. So there's change happening. There's obviously going to be be change within 343 and with Halo. Thing that I was talking about previously was if you need to rip the Band-Aid, you do it. Like this probably needs to be a James Gunn level just reboot of, of what's going on. If that's what it takes, you obviously keep what works, but what isn't working, you move on from it. So to your point of what you brought up, Mike, if that requires them moving to Unreal 5, you move to Unreal 5. I understand the hesitation and the worry of is Halo no longer going to feel like Halo anymore? But then I would throw it back and say, but is anyone even going to engage with Halo if it continues to be what it is today? Because we're obviously seeing from a multiplayer standpoint, we don't have the huge engagement that you would expect for Halo. Yes, I would love to see the campaign continue. That story that that, that it ended with, with Infinite. I would love to see that. But if that requires them pivoting and going a different direction with it to keep Master Chief re relevant and to keep Halo as, as a story relevant, then that's what you do. And if that requires them going to Unreal 5, because this is part of what I was talking about previously, is if they're downsizing 343, you know, and, and part of the issues that rumored is, you know, bringing in contractors are coming in and they're going. If 343 simply did not have the knowledge and the skill set in house to maintain and pump out content for for Halo on a regular basis, then maybe 343 becomes something similar to the initiative where, yes, you are leading the charge. This is your vision for what Halo is going to be. But you're bringing in a Crystal Dynamics as an example, right, to come help you you know, do do the heavy lifting of, of development and getting content out the door. We obviously know certain affinity is already helping 343 with, you know, the rumored battle royale and all that stuff coming. Great. We talked about Rumbleverse earlier. Go get an Iron Galaxy if you need to, right, to help. If the skill set that's out there that's going to help you, they're proficient in Unreal 5 and being able to deliver content in Unreal 5, then that's what you go do. Because if slip space is, and I, I hate using this word, but if slip space is so technically challenging and archaic that you can't get content out on a regular basis and you don't have enough of the skill set in house to deliver that content, then go to where the go where the skill set is, go to where the knowledge is. And if that's on Unreal 5, that's what you do. Because Halo is too important to let it become stagnant, to let it become an afterthought, to let it become a relic of the past. I want Halo to stay relevant. I want to hear that, 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 oh, oh, and get excited about it, right? And see, yeah. you know, see Master Chief and see Cortana. I want to jump into multiplayer with my friends and we're having a blast and we're, we, we got this steady stream of new maps and new modes coming out. Obviously, again, if this Battle Royale turns out to be a thing, I want that to happen. I would love to see other stories in the halo universe i would love to see them do things that aren't necessarily first person what if we got an odst story that was third third person right and you, you're doing something different and unique it doesn't have to be a huge triple a experience it could be a smaller experience it could be a hi-fi rush or a pentiment type experience but it's set in that halo universe these are the kind of things that i want to see happen with halo over over the next five to 10 years or whatever the case may be. So I know I was super long winded. No, you did great. And all that, Mike, but you do what you got to do. Yep. And if that means going to another engine, then that's what you do. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Paris. I, I think the move is imminent. I think it's the right choice as well. And I think, you know, I've been saying on kind of funny games content, whether it be games daily or here, 
you know, we saw this with the Star Wars universe and what Disney's currently doing. Let yes. more people play in the sandbox. You brought yes. up different ideas in the Halo universe. We saw it with Gears Tactics, right? Why don't I have a Halo Tactics, right? What happened to Halo Spartan Assault, the little top-down twin-stick shooter? What happened to Halo right. Wars, right? Halo is the flagship, and it's wild pairs. You put out those comments out to the universe, and people hit you back with, well, Halo's not irrelevant or not relevant to the younger audience, right? I would challenge to say when Halo was at its peak there during that October through December rush when Halo Infinite dropped, everybody was on board, right? This was the moment that Halo was going to onboard new players. This was the moment that Halo Infinite was going to really grow in popularity, but the content wasn't there. The gameplay, the story, the multiplayer, Halo was on top for about three months there, but the content just didn't land, right? And that's where I want to bring our conversation now is content, right? And that was the thing is we didn't get all the content on day one that we were expecting, right? Right. Online multiplayer with ca campaign, not there. Forge wasn't there, right? A number of maps didn't get brought in. If you nailed that within the first three months of Project Tatanka, if you had online co-op campaign right off the bat, we'd be talking a whole different ball game with Halo. Absolutely. And it just didn't happen, right? And so now we look to content. That's why I kind of want to park the bus and talk with you because, of course, Project Tatanka is that rumored battle royale from Jazz Corden, and so many have talked about this, but it seems like from Jason's article that it may have evolved into something more, and I wonder maybe that's why we haven't seen it sooner, right? We needed it during that first six months to a year, but now here we are in year two, and it's still... Where are we at with that? Maybe it's becoming something more because that's what Halo needs right now. The shot in the armor, something fresh and something new. And another big one I, I looked at in that article was developers are working on prototypes and new game pitches with Unreal rather than content for Halo Infinite. And that one kind of stung to me, Paris, when I saw that one, right? Because this was something where... I thought the campaign was very, very good. Yeah, we tested the semi-open world, and some people liked that, some people didn't. But all in all, that was a great experience and a really good story. It's wild to me that when we started Halo Infinite with a 10-year plan, the platform is the word we were using, live service. When we talk about Halo's story, nobody was working on a story after that. Nobody thought we should get some DLC. Let's put a new island in this. Let's get some more mission structure going on. But we were given stories within multiplayer, which turned out to be like two minute long cutscenes before the new season, battle pass stories with armor plating. Like where happened there? And that one really stung to me, Paris, is other people were working on other things besides working on where we were. And I thought, I know we were behind the eight ball, but we got to work on that. We got to get up with that and make sure we're staying up. Well, well, think about it. How can you work on the next DLC for story when all your effort is being spent on fixing, fixing the problems of the, of the current engine and the lack of content for the multiplayer? That needs to be an all hands on deck type of scenario. You can't splinter off a team to go start working on other things when you don't even have what's right in front of you working the way that it should yeah i mean think about it season three is still not out i mean we're, we're still a couple months away from season three even happening right so how can they be also working on on campaign dlc stuff when we got to get this multiplayer right the multiplayer is the live service that's where we're our battle passes that's where we're monetizing this game that's not right we don't have the population of people engaging with this game where it needs to be we can't worry about the, the campaign yet so i'm not surprised I mean, I, 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 I guess weirdly, you know, I thought maybe Joe Staten and his team may have been storyboarding some stuff and getting things ready. But then when this came out and I really thought about it, I was like, well, I actually know it makes sense because you needed to fix everything for the lack of content on multiplayer. So I think when I look at this, like you said, people were already doing concepts with Unreal and all that. I mean, it just leads more credence to the fact that maybe they need to switch the engine. It's slip space. Slip space seems to be the problem here. And they can't truly realize the vision that they want for Halo in that engine. So I, I'll just take it back to what I said before. If you got to move over to that, then that's what you do. Because then now that frees you up, like you were saying with the Battle Royale, maybe it has evolved into something else that has some, some actual story elements in it, some PvP plus PvE elements in it as well. And they can hopefully get that in such a great place to where that can kind of 
carry Halo for another year or two as they ramp up into Unreal. And maybe then they'll start looking at what is the next adventure for Master Chief and, and go explore that. And like I said, maybe now you splinter off and do some other stories in the Halo universe as well with some other studios that 343 can partner up with, right? Maybe they're not AAA, maybe they're smaller in scale, but you get more Halo out there. And I, for lack of a better term, you flood the market with Halo, there you different go. experiences. And then not everyone wants to play a first person shooter, but maybe someone wants to do a third person. Maybe someone wants to do an RTS. Maybe someone wants to do an RPG. <laughs> Hell, maybe there's you bring 808 in there. You do a damn rhythm game with Halo. Who the frick knows? <clears throat> Excuse me. But the point is that IP is so iconic. There's so many stories and scenarios you can do in that universe utilize it do it and then when i even think about it from an entertainment standpoint look we know the halo series is out there your mileage may vary on that season two i'm sure it's in production it is what it is but you cannot tell me that people at 343 and internally at microsoft at xbox has not seen what playstation did with the last of us on hbo and think we need to get our flagship franchise up to that level from an entertainment standpoint, <laughs> excuse me, maybe it's not an HBO show. Maybe it's an anime. Go, go get trigger or something. Do something like with cyberpunk edge runners in the halo universe. I don't know comics. And like, there's so many different things that you could potentially be doing with halo from an entertainment standpoint. That's outside of the game that, you know, they've lightly touched over over the years. Don't get me wrong. I obviously, I know there, there was a, you know, there were some animated things that they did. They obviously tried the other halo series during the halo five stuff. But now we got this series. But now I think the expectation level has been raised even more with this Last of Us series that if you want to do things with Halo outside of the game aspect and entertainment thing, there's going to be an expectation for it now. So there's a lot of work to be done. There, there just is, you know, from 343's uh, standpoint, not only on the game side, but the entertainment side and rebuilding the confidence in the community for the Halo brand of what it potentially could be. All right, two final things before we go. Let's talk about content and what's coming down that we supposedly know. Of course, it's still a rumor, but Project Tatanka. What do you envision this to win over the Halo community and also maybe be a shot in the arm or get some of this player base back? Because in my mind, this has to hit Paris, right? We're already on a massive decline from Halo Infinite. Is Project Tatanka even going to be enough to get this going again? Or will this be what we've seen in the landscape right now with Rumbleverse, for example, of a five to six month sprint and then an immediate crash? What do you expect out of Project Tatanka? And when you look at the gaming landscape, what will win? What is going to work here? Well, I'll, I'll say this. And when I think about, and again, let's just lean into the rumors as if they're true for a second, right? So if certain affinity is making a battle royale, and, you know, it's led by Max Oberman. Let's not forget, I, I jokingly call him the godfather of Xbox Live. What he was able to do with Halo 2 and for Xbox Live back then literally transformed how we did console online gaming. Just did. That's just a fact. If that team has a unique idea that they're working on in the Battle Royale space that isn't just Fortnite, that isn't just Warzone, that's doing something unique that caters to the Halo universe that will get people engaged, that will get us on Fridays and Saturday nights with our buddies wanting to play and we want to buy the battle passes and do all that. I'll be excited to see it. Like I said, to my point, I would imagine it probably has some story element elements in it now, along with PVE and PVP. You know, I would imagine you take it from an ODST perspective and not a Spartan perspective. That way, you know, it can be a little more, it's the word I'm looking for here. You know, Spartan's supposed to be invincible, all kind of stuff, where ODSTs obviously can die a lot quicker. Let's just put it okay, that way, yep. right? Um, maybe there's some weapon variety that you can put in there. Maybe there's a, a, you know, a crafting aspect. I don't know. I'm not a game developer, so I'm just spitballing here. But my point is, it definitely needs to do something outside of the box versus the normal battle royale genre that we've seen, or it literally could die on the vine too. It just could. So... I hope it's something unique. It sounds like, again, if we're believing the rumors, it's on Unreal 5. Let's see what it's going to be. I wouldn't imagine it here in 2023. Hopefully it can come in 2024. But um, it needs to be good. It needs to be very engaging. It needs to hold the, the attention of the community and 
rebuild some of that goodwill in the Halo community so that whatever the next thing is beyond that, people can be excited for it and just go, oh, it's 343 and Halo again, right? I don't personally, I'm I'm a Halo fan. I'm excited about Halo fan, but I, I read the room. I see what people say on social media. And right now, when you, you've seen all these layoffs, you've seen the lack of content, you've seen the changes in leadership, we've seen the struggles that Halo 5 had. You, you, know, you, you see how people complained about Halo 4's multiplayer. You see how the Master Chief Collection launched. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, and I know people get mad, mad at me when I say this. I think Halo peaked at Halo 3. I really do. And when I say that, I'm talking from a campaign and a multiplayer standpoint, the entire package. Love the campaign of Reach. Love the campaign of Halo 4. But the multiplayer, not so much. Obviously, we know about the, ca- the campaign of Halo 5. Wasn't that great? Multiplayer, pretty good. Obviously, we've seen the struggles here with Infinite. We've already talked about the Master Chief Collection struggles. It's been a while since we've actually looked at Halo as a complete package and was like excited about everything in it. So they got work to do, man. They really do. So whatever this battle royale is going to be, I I hope it does something unique that captures the audience attention. Yeah, I've been saying it all the time, and especially on Kind of Funny Games Daily earlier today when we spoke about this, is if you're going to take that shot, you best not miss, right? Because this is a big deal to go into this. You've already had a lot of Halo fans. Remember, Paris, just last year when I said, I think you got to come out with a battle royale, people freaked on the idea. So you're already battling Halo (laughs) traditional fans who don't want this, right? You're battling a dying audience, and now you're going up against the three biggest juggernauts in the space that have not let anyone in the room, right? Apex, Fortnite, and Call of Duty. You look at a Call of Duty audience that's currently struggling with what Warzone is. They expect more and they want more out of that. And what won away from, of course, Call of Duty Blackout and, of course, Fortnite was Apex, bringing in something new, something Mm -hmm. fresh into that. And they brought in something fun. And Halo has all of that. It's just unproven when it comes to this landscape, right? And so I, I, I look at them and I go, man, I really hope this team has something special to deliver because they're fighting a big uphill battle if this is truly going to be a battle royale. Agreed. And you said something on KFGD earlier, and I was was screaming in the chat. You probably didn't see it. But um, you said something on KFGD earlier that really stood out to me, and and I'm paraphrasing here, but this can't be hyperscape. Yep. As an example, and, and no disrespect to the developers and Ubisoft for whatever it was, but Hyperscape came in with all this fanfare and it literally died on the vine. And that's kind of the point. You can't just do what's working right now and expect expect fans of Battle Royales to leave PUBG, to leave Apex, to leave Fortnite, to run to your game and all of a sudden invest in it if you're just doing the same exact thing that those guys are doing. It yep. has to do something to stand out for the from the crowd. Whereas, as an example, Warzone came in, Call of Duty Warzone, and it did enough unique things within kind of the Call of Duty universe that made sense for Call of Duty fans that you had people invest into it. They got to do the same thing with Halo. Yeah, that's my worry, Paris, right, is you can't come in half-cocked into this, and especially into this genre, and also, we're carrying Halo at this point. Halo Infinite dying at the vine, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but we probably won't get another Halo project for another, let's just say, five years. So this is exactly. it right here. you got to carry the torch, and it cannot be three months. It cannot be six months. This has got to be something special where people talk about it for 12 months to two years because we yeah. got a long wait till this next Halo project, and that's what I want to end this on because, of course, we saw the email go out to the staff. Pierre Hintz wrote off the layoffs. He wrote to the 343 team and says, uh, 343 is planning to support a robust live offering for Halo Infinite and its Forge level creator and greenlighting our new tech stack for future Halo games while also bringing Halo to more players through more platforms than ever before. Matt Booty also told uh, Bloomberg that 343 will continue as the internal developer for Halo and as the home of Halo. So let's talk about it, Pairs. Where do we stand right now? Are we ripping the Band-Aid off and saying Halo Infinite is dead? We'll give you some small content updates and we're on to the next thing, which is years away. Can this team send a shock to the system and revive Halo Infinite? Is that even the right move? And most importantly, can certain affinity in this team carry the torch here? 
I think what we're seeing here is Halo Infinite campaign is done. I don't I don't think we see anything else from that. But I do think the multiplayer lives on. And I think there's obviously potential there. It's a good game. It, the multiplayer is good. That, let, let's be crystal clear on that. There's nothing wrong with the multiplayer. You play it as fun as hell. The problem is not having enough modes in there and not having enough unique maps. Um, obviously, they have Forge in there now. You know, when, when Joe, Joe State was on last year, you know, he hinted at some legacy maps coming back. Hopefully, when, when Season 3 drops, hopefully this gap in time it's just them trying to get get to March, I believe, is when it's coming out, is get to season three, get some unique content in there and get on a steady cadence of maps coming out. It may be too little too late, but I do think it's worth trying to continue to support this, at least for the next couple of years. Obviously, the Battle Royale could probably come in that could be that could supplement it repl- slash replace it buy them some more time. As he's as he just mentioned, they work on the tech stack if it is Unreal 5, and start ramping up for the next phase of what Halo is going to be. And like I said, if that means they got to just abandon Infinite and move on to something else, that's what you do. Don't try to... Again, I I keep going back to the the James Gunn thing, but instead of... Sorry, Greg Miller, but instead of trying to put Band-Aids on the DCEU, he said, you know what? We're starting over. We have to. That's the only way I can properly tell a a, a a great story is by ripping the band-aid off and just doing something new and if that means i got to rip the band-aid off for, for halo and do something new then you do it again the great analogy god of war there was a bunch of greater god of war games until 2018 they ripped the band-aid did something new now we've had two fantastic versions of this new god of war which pays homage to the past but it's moving forward doing something new just a tough spot to be in Paris here. Yeah. You and I love this one-on-one because yeah. we're two years into the console generation, right? This was a new console generation that was going to lead the way with Halo Infinite at the forge of it all and really showcasing what this is po- possible. Had a year-long mm-hmm. delay. Now we get into it. It's a year later, and we're talking about where do we stand with Halo Infinite and does this franchise still have it, right? And for me... You know, I don't expect much, right? I I hope that this development team at 343 can prove me wrong and really deliver. But as I look at Halo Infinite now, that's dead to me, right? Like I've moved on from that and now I need certain affinity to bring me something. And I hope that this team at Xbox and 343 are in the background going, okay, we're restarting now. Yeah, that's going to be X amount of years in the future. What can we do to bring in a team and make a smaller Halo project right now that can be out in the next two to three years? Because I can't have Mike and the Halo diehards. I can't have our brand wait on a five-year project down the line with a brand new console generation and a bad taste in my mouth from Halo Infinite going, man, that was so short-lived on something that was so special and so good, and we just couldn't keep this pace on there. And it's really an interesting situation to be in with a flagship title like this, right? It'd be one thing if we were talking about something small but we are talking about the face on the box Paris which is wild to me yeah yeah it is and look Halo's been around for 20 years so it's not like this is just some flash in the pan it it has had a couple decades of of being around and being relevant in our in our lives but if Halo needs to evolve for the next generation of gamers that that are coming up now then you, you you have to do it I mean infinite clearly didn't work the way that they intended. So now, now you, you evolve into something else. I, I want to remain optimistic, but I, I, I'll say this and then I'll end on this. I actually look at the bigger picture of it since this is an Xbox show and you just think about Xbox Game Studios. You're at 20-something studios at this point, right? You should not have to rely. It'd be nice to have Halo be the flagship, but at, we're getting to the point where you should not have to rely on Halo because you have all these studios, you have all these IPs that that are coming up. This is why it's important for Xbox Game Studios to now get on their cadence and start releasing regular content. Like we just got Hi-Fi Rush. We know Minecraft and Redfall and Starfield and all that stuff's coming. The Hellblade 2s, the Avowed, the Perfect Darks, (laughs) excuse me, the Fables of the World. Now's the time. You got to start doing that because if Halo needs an extended break to get itself right, <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm making a call, you know, to the bullpen. Come on. I, I yeah. need you guys to come in 
and 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 carry this for a few years until we can get Halo to where it should be. Because the one thing that 343 and Xbox cannot do is rush Halo out just to make sure it's out there so we see it. No, if Halo needs to go dark for a while, that's what you do. And then when it does resurface, it's feature complete. And it's exactly everything. It's the vision that 343 wants it to be. Well said, Period. Paris. And that's how we're going to end this episode because only the future will tell where we stand with this franchise. But we kind of know the now. Of course, you know, this was Jason Schreier. Go check it out over on Bloomberg. Some of this coming to light. What's real? What's not real? What are the rumors that might come true? There's so much more. But only the future will show us this. But a great episode, Paris. I really appreciate the candid one-on-one -on -one about Halo. I loved us paying some love to Rumbleverse. And most importantly, I loved yes. us celebrating games. Because you just got Halo hit with two great games and of course shout out to dead space remake out there three great games to kick off the new year with we your xbox one. consoles tell we me we forgot one goldeneye and go we're going to talk about goldeneye because i'm halfway through it we'll talk about that next week but yeah paris you've been hit with a whole lot of good games that we need to celebrate we need to have fun with and so hopefully you xbox players out there are jumping into hi-fi rush come play with me in age of empires 2 enjoy split screen co-op with your friends on the couch if you got goldeneye and uh, of course most importantly go play dead space and get scared but let us know in the comments down below what are your feelings and thoughts on Halo and everything coming out of Bloomberg? Let me know some of your favorite moments from Rumbleverse as we celebrate and say goodbye. You have one more month to play it. And most importantly, have you played Hi-Fi Rush and gotten in rhythm? Let us know. With that, thank you all so much for tuning in to me and Paris and, of course, the XCast crew. We'll see you back here next week. See you, gamers.